Welcome to Lesson 3D, Integral Linear Momentum Equation. In this lesson, we'll derive the integral or control volume form of the linear momentum equation. We'll use the Reynolds Transport Theorem to do this. Then we'll talk about forces on the control volume, body forces, and surface forces. We'll also define the stress tensor. To derive this equation, we start with the Reynolds Transport Theorem and Newton's Second Law. But think about this product rule d d t of m u i equal m d u i d t plus u i d m d t, where m is the mass of the system. But d m d t is zero if you're following a fluid particle, which is what this special material derivative notation means. So we rewrite Newton's law as d m u i d t equal f i. This is an alternate form of Newton's second law. It's valid at any instant in time. Recall from high school physics that mass times velocity is linear momentum. So this left-hand side represents the time rate of change of linear momentum of a fluid particle following the fluid, which is our definition of material derivative. The right side of the equation is the net force acting on the fluid particle. We call this equation the linear momentum relation. Some people call it conservation of linear momentum. But momentum is not really conserved. Linear momentum changes as we move along due to these forces. We can extend this to a material volume, V of t. In other words, a volume moving with the fluid. Our linear momentum equation can be written as d dt of the volume integral rho ui dv equals sigma f v i, where rho ui is the linear momentum per unit volume. And it's a vector, of course, because momentum is a vector. And this is in tensor notation. Some textbooks call this capital MI, which would be the linear momentum of the material volume, where we've integrated over the material volume. The left-hand side of this equation is the time rate of change of momentum of the material volume following the material volume. And the right-hand side is the sum of all forces acting on the material volume. Now let's apply our Reynolds Transport Theorem. I rewrote the Reynolds Transport Theorem here. To get this into the proper form, we let phi equal rho ui, the linear momentum per unit volume, so that it agrees with the left-hand side of our Newton's Law. Plugging this in, we get the time rate of change of our material volume equals sum of all the forces on the material volume. This part comes from Newton's Law. This is also equal to the sum of forces on the control volume. And from the Reynolds Transport Theorem, we have the volume integral and the surface integral. The key to our argument here is that at any instant in time, the material volume V and the control volume are coincident. In other words, they occupy the same space. We've made this argument before. If this is our material volume at time t, and it's in a flow field, it moves and distorts as it moves with the fluid. So this is the volume at some later time. But we choose our control volume to be at exactly the same location and same volume at time t as the material volume. The control volume can move or distort any way we choose, independent of the flow. But our argument here is that at this time t, these two blobs or potatoes of fluid are at the same location. They occupy the same volume. Therefore, any forces that act on it will be the same, whether you're talking about the material volume at time t or the control volume at time t. Now we can look at the left and right sides of this equation like we did with conservation of mass. This part is the system, or Lagrangian side, and this part is the control volume, or Eulerian side. The system side comes from Newton's second law, the fundamental momentum equation for a material volume. The right side comes from Reynolds' transport theorem. Thus, it is our integral or control volume form of the linear momentum equation. I rewrite it here. The control volume or integral form of the linear momentum equation is the part we encircled in blue here. But fluid mechanicians like to write force on the right-hand side of the equation. So the form that we'll commonly use has the left and right sides switched, as I rewrote here. This, then, is the equation that we'll call the control volume form of the linear momentum equation. Now we need to look at this term, the sum of all forces acting on the control volume. 
we'll split sigma FCVI into two parts, body forces that act on the whole volume, for example, gravity forces, magnetic forces, etc., plus surface forces, for example, pressure and viscous forces. Note that we're taking our control volume as the fluid, so these are the only forces that act. We're not cutting through any struts or cables or anything like that. But if our control volume would include those kinds of forces, we would add those. These two are only for the fluid. Let's look at the body forces. We consider only gravity forces here. So sigma FB sub I is the integral over the control volume of rho GI dV, where typically if x3 or z is up, the gravity vector is down. In tensor notation here, gi is the ith component of gravity vector g. So for this case, we only have the third component acting in the negative x3 direction. As a sanity check, if rho and gi are constants, sigma fbi is rho gi, and this integral just gives us the volume, which we recognize as the weight of the fluid. But this form is valid even if the flow is compressible, and even if gravity varies throughout the volume. But that would be the case only for extremely large control volumes. Now let's look at the surface forces, sigma FSI. We define the stress tensor, which has dimensions of force per area, as Tij. This tensor acts on any surface of the fluid, and this surface can be an actual surface or an imaginary surface just cutting through the fluid. The convention for this stress tensor is that Tij is the J component of stress acting on a surface whose outward normal is in the I direction. This is the convention we'll use for all our work. So let's derive an expression for sigma FSI. Let's take our volume at some time T, which as we've said is also our control volume, at time t, and we look at some small area element dA, the outward normal is dA vector, and the surface force Fs acts in some direction. Instead of a square, let's consider an element that's triangular in shape. What we'll do is magnify this, and we'll split it into three faces that are aligned with the coordinate axes, x1, x2, x3. First, our coordinate system has x1, x2 in the plane, and x3 coming out of the plane. We'll draw three faces of this triangular surface, and I'm trying to do this three-dimensionally. These three faces are the projections of the actual surface which is hidden underneath this. This is kind of a prism coming out of the page here. The top surface has area component dA2, the right surface dA1, and the front surface dA3. Following our index convention, the outward normals would be T11, T22, and T33. This component would be T13 because it's acting in the X3 direction, the J component of stress, but it's acting on this surface whose normal is in the 1 direction, the X1 direction. Similarly, this would be T12, and we complete T21, T23, T31, and T32. These three faces are projections of the surface element dA onto our Cartesian coordinate system. The overall force, both magnitude and direction, which we called Fs, is the same as that acting on dA itself. This is true, of course, as dA shrinks to a point. So all these stresses acting on these three surfaces must add up to the overall force acting on the surface that's hidden behind these. Let's sum all the forces in the x1 direction. We'll call it sigma fs1. And looking at our diagram, we sum all the forces acting in the x1 direction. t11 times projected area dA1, which is the area of this triangle, the rightmost one, plus t21 times the area of this top surface, dA2. And similarly, t31 dA3 from this force acting on this surface. We do a similar thing for the x2 and the x3 directions, and when we combine everything together in tensor notation, sigma FSI on element dA turns out to be TJI dAj. You can see the j's summing here, and the i being a free index here. As a free index, i is 1, 2, 3, but j is summed from 1 to 3. 
finally we need to integrate, since this is just a little element dA, over the whole control surface. So finally, sigma FSI on the control surface is the integral over the entire control surface of TJI dAJ. This is the total surface force on our control volume. One comment, since TIJ is symmetric, we can also write sigma FS sub I is the integral of TIJ dAJ. That's just an alternate expression. This first one is valid even if TJI were not symmetric. Now we combine the body and surface forces to get our final form of the equation. Integral over the control volume of del del T of rho ui dv plus integral over the control surface of rho ui uj daj equal integral over the control volume rho gi dv plus integral over the entire control surface tji daj. This equation is the integral linear momentum equation or the control volume linear momentum equation. Since we use the general Reynolds transport theorem to derive this, this is valid for the general case of a moving control volume. Of course, it also applies to a stationary control volume. In the next lesson, we'll derive the differential form of this equation. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.